SPIE presents the Advancing the Laser series, honoring 50 years of laser achievements. Professor David Payne, Director of the Optoelectronics Research Center at the University of Southampton. I started here way back in 1967 as one of the world's first PhD students dealing with the new technology of optical fiber telecommunications. Shortly after uh, the great stimulating paper by Charles Cow that says it might be possible and we could span the world with millions of kilometers of fiber and all we got to do is get the loss down to something reasonable. Whilst Charles had pointed out that silica was the way to go and might be low enough loss, it was a big might. Nobody really knew. And in you know, retrospect, oh well of course it was low loss, but nobody knew at that time. So it was an incredible arrogance to say, yeah, 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 a window glass um, will absorb 30% of the light going through it. Now what we're going to do is we're going to go across an ocean with this stuff. <laughs> Amazing. Then of course there was the great announcement by Corning in 1970 that indeed Charles Cowell was right and that by doping silica and um, using the chemical vapor deposition process you could get losses down to 17 dBs per kilometer. That sounds a pretty high number in today's figures, but at the time it was a revolution. And finally, we came, we thought of the idea, well, let's go back and put some rare earths in, into this fiber. So, you know, that work had been initially uh, reported back in the 60s by Eli Snitzer. And of course, he had multimode fibers. He didn't have silica, they didn't have diode pumps. So what Eli did, fantastic piece of prescient work, was he wrapped a multi-mode fiber doped with neodymium around a flash lamp and went pop, pop, pop with a flash lamp and made the first fiber laser. Fantastic. We came back to this in the mid-80s and said, hey, life's changed. So we had the silica, we had the ultra-low loss, because we had diodes as well so that we could end pump these things. And so when you read our initial papers, we are marveling about, gee, isn't this wonderful? We can put the impurities back in without increasing the base loss. So we still got a low loss fiber. Now we've got absorption bands and laser bands throughout this, which we can use to make amplifiers and lasers. So very productive period. We were the only people working on it at the time. And off we went to a conference uh, in Venice. And we wrote in the paper we submitted to that that rare earth dope fibers had a very broad line width and this would suit them for inline amplifiers uh, for telecommunications. And we had no idea whether that was true. <laughs> we hadn't even demonstrated one. This was 1985. It wasn't until 1987 that we made the first report of what is now a day is called the EDFA Erbium Doped Fiber Amplifier. So incredibly, we published 27 papers on putting erbium into optical fibers as a laser before we figured out, let's take the mirrors away and we've got an amplifier. And you know that in January, 1987, we reported that at OFC, and everybody says, wow, because now you weren't limited to 100 kilometers before you had to put a, uh, what I sometimes refer as, as a toll gate, uh, slowing up all the traffic. Now you just put a piece of fiber in with a diode pump, and everything just whizzes through it. But you know, there's some interesting, unexpected uh, consequences of that, which was that it fueled what is today called WDM, Wavelength Division Multiplexing, because the amplifier is wavelength, or color if you prefer, agnostic. It doesn't care about you know, all the fact that there's multiple different colored channels coming in. It just passes them through without mixing them up. 
where, of course, the old way of doing things with electronic amplifiers, the you know, electronic amplifier couldn't tell the difference between the colors, so we just mix them up. And this, this then fueled an explosion in bandwidth capability of fiber, where people started to put in multiple, up to a thousand channels um, of uh, different colors, each one carrying 10, 50, 40, maybe even 100 gigabits per second per channel. You know, to where we are today, where people routinely talk about 10 terabits per second capacity in, in the optical fiber, uh, all enabled, when you think about going back to the history, by, first of all, the Charles Carr work, and the Corning work, and then the optical amplifier. Uh, and the interesting question is, what's next? Because, you know, we are running out of this bandwidth. And if you look at the projections, the data rate in the, in the fiber is still doubling every couple of years. And you know, the fiber is, does not have an infinite bandwidth. There's a few things we can do yet to, to gain another factor of two or maybe even factor of four. But think about it, a factor of four gains you four years. Hey, what are we going to do after that? A lot of us are starting to think about, let's go back to the early days when we're all looking at chunks of physics and wondering whether it worked and saying, it's time for another chunk of physics. Now, what might that chunk of physics be that will change everything again? And I think we're going to have to think very hard about the future. Start planning for you know, this doubling every two years. And you know, can we handle it? Going back to the physics and asking, what other devices could we make that might change everything? Just as the fiber changed everything, just as the EDFA changed everything, what's next? Back to the physics, back to the labs, make some widgets that might be a super fast switch, for example incredibly cheap. Can we do it? Like all things in physics, you don't really know. But that's what Charles was faced with. When he looked at silica, he didn't really know. But boy, did it produce an explosion.